So losses, a bit of an understanding in terms of really saying, let's think about and quantify those losses. And that study or the studies that we're looking at, there was a study supported by GRDC and run with the GGA group over in Western Australia. And the losses there were, they went out and did a study that looked at about 100 harvesters, is that right Ben? Yeah, about 100 and 200 trade drops. So. 200 trade drops, so in terms of that study, the, the numbers when we, if we extrapolate those losses over what is the South Australia, Victoria region, we're looking at $178 million worth of losses. Yeah, that's a, that's a big number. When you then try and divide that by the number of growers that are actually harvesting in those spaces, it's, it's, it's that quantifiable element of going, mm, I'm looking at a big number there. So when we look at those losses, we, we looked at front losses and we looked at machine losses. Now that was quite um, startling, Ben. Do you want to give us, you're involved in developing the protocol on that. Do you want to give us a bit of an understanding how it went? Yeah, so, so just to give you a picture of what, what we ended up doing, there was a, a, a protocol written that allowed us to have a look at losses from the, from the whole harvesting process. Does anyone have an idea of what losses typically should be out of a harvester? Say for cereals, what, what would you aim for? 1% spot on, yeah. So about 1% is what you'd normally aim for with cereals. So that study that was done in WA found that for barley, for example, we're losing about 4.5%. Uh, wheat, about two and two, a bit over two percent, and canola about about three percent. Now canola, you know, we'd, we'd aim to get under three percent if we can. It's normally pretty tricky, but the cereals, you know, alone, you know, we, we we know that we could probably do a much better job than what we're doing. So there's a huge opportunity to get this right without minimising capacity. And the likes of Brett and Cassie today will talk about all the tools uh, that, that they've got knowledge of and and, uh, and have tried in the past that you can then apply uh, at, at this coming harvest. The study that was done in the west, um, yeah, we dropped uh, we dropped trays uh, in front of the front, uh, and then looked at front losses specifically, and then also uh, off the back. So we were able to identify sieve and rotor losses um, from a stack of different machines over there. But it was uh, across all different brands, and as as Pete said, when you extrapolate those losses out and look at the value of the crop at harvest for WA, it was three hundred million, and about uh, if, you, if you applied those same losses here, it was about one hundred and eighty odd million. So it's a, it's a big number and hence we're kind of thinking what that means. But you're, what Ben is talking about, what we all also want you to understand is also how do I, in terms of, as, as you rightly put, what's that, what's that critical piece I go where I go I get capacity versus I'm managing my losses. And we know from, from examples, like the, uh, the guy who's in... Um, uh, across the Victoria area, he was doing both his canola and his wheat. He was doing his measurement, so he's actually out quantifying, looking at what his losses were, looking at the machine losses. He saw in his canola, he got it down to under 1%. He was like, great, I've got my losses down. His biggest challenge was having wet cereals. He had wet wheat. I think we may have a little bit of that this year. A bit of a concern, I think. His issue is he said, look, my, my challenge is the fact that I could only therefore go and harvest from the afternoon and I've got a limited window. What he did was increase his speed by one kilometre, which is almost a 20% increase for him in, in his performance. But in measuring, he could also keep his losses down at 1%. So he was doing that level of going, how do I get that capacity and productivity so he can actually get his crop off? Uh, and that's what we really want you to be thinking about. We're not measuring because we think measuring's interesting. We're measuring because we're worried about that, aren't we? Because when we think about these machines, what are we saying these things are to run now, Ben? Well, if you typically look at uh, fuel costs, the uh, cost of running a chase of driver, driver, um, and the machine, just the machine operating costs, we're looking at about 700 bucks an hour is normally what you'd operate on, and probably north of that for a newer, higher value machine. So the cost is pretty significant. So as well as balancing the loss side of the equation, you also need to balance the machine performance side of the equation and make sure that, that we're getting the most out of the machine as we possibly can. So. Yeah, so you, you, then we know fuel's gone up and up, you know, diesel's not likely to come down at the moment, is it? So we've got to balance that element. If we can save days, 
that's a that's a lot of money that we can we can put to something else so, and or uh, in you know, another good example I had a, a guy who was doing small clover harvesting um, he made a huge saving in his small clover but again in his cereals he increased his capacity his issue was he then started seeding the next day and his comment was well Pete I, I didn't realize I tell you we talked about it I didn't realize that I'd increased my speed and we'd finished three or four days earlier. That three or four days earlier and the ability to go and seed was against his neighbours who didn't actually get their crop in. I said to Mark, I said, so how do I quantify that? And he said, I don't know how you do that, mate, but for me it just means I've got a crop in. And that's the big deal in terms of what they do. Out of, out of interest, um, is anyone measuring losses off their machine at harvest at the moment? Yep. What do you what do you what do you go? Uh, we, we got something similar to that. Yep. Um, yeah. So we only got it last year, so we're still playing around with it. But yep. It's it yeah certainly was pretty pretty good when we made some changes. Probably uh, over the back of the concave, we could see big differences. Yeah. And did you get any increased capacity, or it was just mainly uh, minimising? Probably losses? more. Oh, you know, both actually. Yeah. 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 Yep, so you got the both, both benefits. Yeah. 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 What was the crop? So you were. Uh, that was in can well, canola and wheat. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So there was another one over here. Yeah. Um, just canola and wheat mainly. Yeah. Just yeah, drop trays underneath. Sort of yeah. Wheat sort of around that one and a half to two percent, and then yeah, canola's around that four. We struggled a bit on canola last year. Yeah. That can be pretty tricky. Yeah. 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 So in terms of that, when were you actually measuring? Um, like sort of just when we pull in, we're just yeah setting it up. Probably should have done it more during, but yeah, mainly just setting it up, getting it right when you pull into the wheat for the first time. Yeah. 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 And that's a really good point. Is when when do we actually go and do these measurements? Talking to some other guys, what they're doing is they're setting the three benchmark levels. So if I'm going into my canola or I'm going into my wheat, I'll go and set a level of, it, the, it relates to the morning. This is now. And then in the, when it comes to the heat of the day, I've got to measure now and I'm putting down those details. And when it comes to the early evening, so they've got something to reference back to. Literally, as this, um, Michael Alters was saying, is it just that next time I get in the machine, because I'm doing shifts and someone else is coming in, I sit in the seat and I'm going, what's on my app? There it is, I've got something to reference to. And then going from there to actually going, okay, what do I need to change? But let so I was just going to say, is it worth just giving a quick demo of how this works? I think we should. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen this, this is the bushel plus, and there are others out there, very similar sort of arrangement. You can also get um, small stainless steel trays that say Rod Gribble makes as well. Anything will do. Ice cream lids are a yep. good start if you've got nothing and, and you haven't got the gear in. in uh, Maybe you have cars. Water. You can use all sorts of stuff. Yep. Yeah. Just as long as you're doing some form of measurement, um, then doing it safely. So the reason behind these sort of things and what you're talking about is to be able to do this safely. This goes on the, the axles. So those permanent magnets uh, that sits on the axle or you put it on the, oh, we can put it on the back of the header front there for yeah, um, put it on the header front and then... Typically on the back axle and, and uh, so those permanent magnets hold this cover, pl cover tray in place and this is the actual drop tray itself. So once that's mounted up onto the machine, the drop tray just clips up there. I'll give you the remote here, Pete. I've got it here. All right, done. So basically you're harvesting along, you've got this mounted in underneath the harvester. Um, you get up, you get the machine full and, and full operating conditions, and you get a, a uh, an idea of uh, you know, what uh, machine specs and settings you've got, and typically a good a photo of the screen uh, at that point in time is a, is a good way to go. And then it's usually the chaser bin driver or yeah. someone in the paddock says, right, grab a shot, tray drops, and then the machine continues to harvest. So what you end up with in that tray is all the residue out of the machine as well as any, any uh, wheat or any uh, product that you, you might have, uh, any uh, grain that, that might have been lost through the machine process, so. And once you've done that, the key, I guess this is the bit of gold that comes with all these sort of things, regardless of whether you're using lids or, or whatever, is the ability to take the sample, and then once, once you've got your sample, is you've got to separate that out. And blow your sample out. 
because the key with any of this is the actual making it easy to get it done so you do it more frequently. Take that sample, weigh out the air sample and then put it in the calculator. You can either use the Bushel Plus calculator or there's a calculator on the GRDC website that Pete Humes has done, um, Rob Gribble's got a calculator. So there's different options you've got there. But with that number, you, you're then going, what have I got? What am I going to be, what do I see in terms of my losses and what are, what's acceptable in relation to what I want to try and achieve? Because it's going to be about, I'm trying to get this capacity that's acceptable for my program versus the acceptable losses. And then I might make one change because I'm going, okay, maybe I can go a little bit faster or maybe I can increase capacity slightly and or reduce my loss. And you make one change with it. One change only is the... And it could be as simple as just changing fan speed by 50 RPM, saying canola, you know, that, that's, that's a really tricky one and as you would have found out, you know, just say small adjustments by, um, you know, within with fan speed might be all, all you need to do to drop losses down and still maintain capacity. Just, just be aware that you don't always get the same response. So an uh, example of a grower who was losing about 270 kilograms in his canola, which is way too much, dropped his fan speed by about 50. That went down to, that went down to around 100, dropped it again, went it down to, to 70. Okay, I'm getting close, dropped it again, and it went back up. And then went back the other way, increased the fan, and found that right spot where are going, I'm really comfortable with what it's going to be. So sometimes you've got to push it up and down before you get an answer that actually fits what you want. It isn't always going down, down, down. It's getting that equitable point. Jesse, did you want to mention? Yeah. So once we've got it separated there, um, Peter gave me this little separator. So once we've got it out of there, we can chuck it in here. And you can see you've got different screens with different sizes. So you can shake the sample that you've got in here. Give it a shake, all the big stuff will stay at the top, so that's mostly chaff. Little sticks will go through, and then around this one here we'll have our good grain, and then to the bottom two we'll have broken grain. So the broken grain is just as good as lost grain, so we need to have a look at that broken grain as well. If we see the broken grain there, we need to go and make adjustments on our machine to try to minimise that. So yeah, that's a nice little tool, but you can have a look at that once it's in the sample, just chuck it out on the tray and see whether you can find broken grain in there as well. I think, I think it's a real important point that Cassie's making is we, it's not just about the losses, it's actually what we see. Because if we're seeing broken grain in that tray, what does that mean, guys? What, do, what, do we, what does the broken grain mean? Well, loss, yeah. Loss. The team's not at proper capacity. Yep. Threshing too hard. Threshing too hard, probably. Yep. So it's telling us something we can do rather than just leaving as it is, yeah? Yeah, right, so we, that's kind of asking ourselves the question of what it means. That's a really, really important element for what we want to try and achieve. Anything else you want to cover on? I was just gonna say the other part of, uh, of the loss side of things, I don't know if you guys had any mice issues here at all? Yeah, a couple of nods. So obviously one of the, one of the problems with leaving a fair bit of grain in the paddock is that, uh, oh that's good, the crutches are gone now, I don't have to go and bloody pick up a hand post. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the beauties of, uh, of, of uh, you know, quantifying this loss is you also get an indication of how much mouse feed you might be leaving in the paddock. Um, Steve Henry from CSIRO tells us that we want to be leaving um, no more than 100 kilograms per hectare in the paddock because at 100 kilograms per hectare, uh, we make sure that when we come to a seeding or seeding time and we want to put out mouse bait, that we're going to get maximum bank for our buck with that mouse bait. So uh, if you've got mice issues, the last thing we want to be doing is feeding them. <laughs> you know, so, so making sure that our losses are minimised from that perspective is also important. So there's a few aspects to it, the quality, the mice, and, and obviously the sheer dollars we're leaving in the paddock. So with those mice, we, we know that um, one mouse will eat about three, three and a half grams a day. Right? Three and a half grams a day. So who's doing barley here? Yep. So, what, Pete? What's your what's your barley yield? Oh well, supposedly we're supposed to be getting sort of seven ton or better. Yeah. 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 So, if we think of a seven ton and we're just we're losing half a percent on a seven ton, yeah, that's about thirty five grams. We thirty five kilograms. We're going to be losing thirty five kilograms is going to be enough in a four hundred hectare program to feed three point three million mice. 
That's a shed load of mice. And what's important is that we actually, like we're going to talk about with harvest weed seed control, is we're building barriers up front. Not when we've got the mice, but we're preventing it today. Everything we do, I mean, you guys know this, you know that what you do in harvest affects seeding. What we do in seeding affects harvest. So we've got to build those little walls together, every single thing we do, every decision. You guys know that? Just kind of a bit of a reminder for ourselves to go, it's the same with the mice. Okay, is there anything else you want to cover on the front, so on the losses before we move on? No, I don't think so, unless any questions sort of on the loss measurement side of things? It's I've got a lot of weeds over They come with scales, know. they come with scales and everything else, so you, you weigh it out. The only thing we suggest, with those scales that um, Ben's got there, what we, what we often suggest is, firstly, if you're going to do your measurement, is you either do it on the, um, do it on the tray, that's got the lid, which Ben's nicely handed to me here. Here's one I had earlier. Um, you can either weigh it in here, because that way you avoid the breeze. What we tend to do, steal some Tupperware out of the kitchen, small Tupperware container about yay big that fits in there. So once you've got your sample, whether you've done your measurement off your front, whether you're doing your rotor or your sieve, you put your sample in there, header driver keeps going, chaser bin driver goes, I'll go and do the measurements, and you can do it out the way. And I, I do a lot of it inside here, because then there's nothing, no air, nothing blowing around, and I can do my measurements nice and easily. Because they are pretty, you're right, they're pretty sensitive scales. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you're trying to measure fractions of grams of canola, you want to yeah. make sure you get it right, so yeah. The, and the other side of that, the, um, Cassie, you, you talk about when you're doing measurements, once you've got it, you talk about, tell us how you go about it. <clears throat> so obviously the, the main one is sitting on, underneath the back axle, because that's where you, you, know, you want to see what's coming through the rotor and coming through the spreaders. Um, but I have done it in the past where I would put it underneath the belly of the machine. So drop it underneath the belly and also on the feed hours. So drop it on the feed hours. That way, before it gets to our spreaders here, we can pull up and we can go and have a look. And if there's any leaks going through the machine itself, uh, the clean grain trough, we've seen that in the past where it's leaking out of the clean grain trough. Um, and also these seals here on the side, you can leak through that as well. Um, so if you pull up before the spreaders gets to it, you can actually see the lines that's sitting in the, in the box itself. You can see the lines there. So then you can go back to the machine and go and have a look at it and see where it's coming from. Um, also something to remember, once that, that tray is on the ground, if you pick that tray up and see what's on the ground, that's losses that's already been there before the machine got, got to it. Um, what I've seen in the past, you know, you get to it, you lift it up, pick it up, and there's half threshed heads that's sitting on the ground. In the past, if we would just go to the back of the head and scratch on the ground and have a look at it, we wanted to go and chase up and see why the machine is not crashing. In the meantime, that head has been sitting on the ground there without going through the machine. So yeah, it's a good tool to pick it up and have a look in underneath it and see what's going on in that. Um, to do that, Cathy, you, you may leave the, the tray in situ and just lightly pick up the, the heavy material yep. on the top so you, you can see the grain in the tray. Off, yeah. Yeah. And then once you get used to it, you can pick all the heavy material off and have a look, without moving the tray, just have a look what's sitting in the tray and see whether there's more grain to the left or more grain to the right, and also whether there's a line of grain sitting there. So yeah, it's, very, it's a very handy tool. Um, with those little steel plates, stainless steel plates that you can get, I've, in the past I used cake tins and throw the cake tin out because we know that's about a foot by a foot, the cake tin. Throw that out and then on the, John Deere's got a good app out, the Go Harvest app, and there's a calculator on that. So all that you want to measure is you're going to get four grams out of that cake tin and you can put the actual size of the tray that you're dropping, you can put that into your calculator. So it doesn't say if it's one metre long by 300, you can put any size that you want, you can put in that. And if you see you get four grams of grain, you can make adjustments on the machine, chuck that same tray out and see whether that four grams are coming down or going up and then you know you're on the right track. So you don't need to have the Bushel Plus app to have a look at it, you can just do the measure and see whether it's getting less or more. I think there's a, uh, also important, you're mentioning there, Cassie, which is measuring different areas. So not just going, I'm measuring off the back axle, I'm looking at where I'm getting spread, left and right, to see what my machines are doing. And I know Brett and Cassie today will talk to you about that, because we need to understand what our machines are doing there. 
Um, something that I would like to measure, uh, mention, it's something that you don't think about, but two weeks ago when we were in WA, we actually started harvesting canola, and we put a drop tray at the back of the front there, so before the machine goes over it, before you get the residue out of the back, we would pick that tray up and go through it and have a look at it. And we actually found broken and cracked grain just from the front. So have a look at that. Sometimes you might be chasing it in the header, but the damage is already done at the front. And there's nothing you can do about that.